this session. Thank you for reminding me. And um, I'm just putting my name in here too. I have to say, I was like on top of this during Expo, but a week has gone by, I'm a little slow. Okay, thank you everyone for doing that. And then um, I'm assuming everybody knows how to use Zoom. Is that, can you just give me a thumbs up if you kind of, if you do at this point in our pandemic lives? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I think we're gonna be okay. The way this is gonna work is, um, John will take over shortly as soon as I stop talking and we'll run the, the, the tour with Bobby Joe. While that's happening, if you have questions, maybe they do it. If they don't, we'll have them in the chat to uh, make sure that John can ask them of Bobby Joe once, we, once the tour is complete, because there will be time for a question and answer session afterwards. And my job is to read those questions to John. So that's, that's what I'll be doing. And once the tour is complete, um, and you're in the question and answer session. Um, John has put together a list of resources that he's asked me to put up on the screen so that they will show up in the recording. So I will go ahead and do that. I will also be putting them into the chat box and you have the opportunity if you just uh, put your cursor inside the chat box itself and hit control copy, uh, control C or you know, however you normally hit copy on your computer you can copy the contents of the chat box and then paste it someplace else and save the contents themselves. Um, and you can also email uh, me or John and we can give you the contents of the chat box later. And I only share that because um, it will be another way to get access to this uh, very list of resources John's put together. So the last thing I will say um, is that this event is free and uh, it comes to you courtesy of Arrow. And if you are inclined and um, have the means to support Arrow in helping either fund this event or just our, our references everywhere, um, please go ahead and, and uh, I don't know what's happening here. Please just go ahead and, and uh, feel free to donate to us. And I've put our our link in the chat box should you feel inclined to do that now you have that access there so without further ado i am going to pass the baton on to john and um i would i think the thing i will say before i stop talking is if you've got your video screen set up on speaker view in the top right corner you can change it to um to speaker view from gallery view, excuse me, and then that will bring Bobby Joe forefront on your screen, and you can you'll have a better view of her uh, camera while she's doing the tour. And now I'm going to pass the baton on to John. Oh, thanks, Robin. It's really great to be here uh, today. Um, I'm uh, tuning in from just outside of Helena, <clears throat> and uh excited to be here and really excited that arrow uh and robin stepped up uh, when i had the idea uh after seeing bobby joe and ned harvesting a bunch of lettuce a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> and uh starting from just a seed of uh, a reminder that last June, um, the other side of the of the solstice, uh, we had done um, a tour of their greenhouse as it was um, sort of just getting up and running, and uh, and so seeing all of this harvest that they had coming up, uh, I was excited to do it again, and then it's just exploded into uh, a webinar and. They've been so wonderfully gracious to to do this uh, on a on a Sunday morning, uh, Sunday afternoon, I guess here, uh, and I'm really really happy to to have them here. I met uh, Bobby, Joe, and Ned a couple of years ago in uh, South Dakota for a uh, the annual meeting of the. 
Dakota Resource Council uh, there. And I was really excited to know that they were in the process of building one of these greenhouses because that's definitely on my list. And to be involved in in that one and as many as I can. And uh, I'm just gonna say a, just a brief little bit more in that <clears throat> Arrow had their annual meeting, our annual meeting uh, here a month or so ago, uh, and it was online. And the, the last event of that two week uh, easy uh, <laughs> endeavor was, uh, an interview that I did with Bob Quinn, who is a farmer, organic farmer up outside of Big Sandy, Montana, and who is in the process of building one of these greenhouses as well. So uh, I had an <clears throat> opportunity to sit down and talk with him really informally about how, uh, how it was going for him, why he was doing it and uh, stuff like that. So a little bit of a sense of, of format that we're, we're gonna do here. So uh, I guess <clears throat> I'm gonna quit talking and uh, ask um, Bobby, Joe and Ned to give us a little bit of a view from the outside, if you will. And as Robin said before, uh, you, you go up to the top right-hand corner of your screen and in the view, uh, click on that and they'll, uh, I'll drop down and you can do a uh, speaker and that will give you a full view of whoever is, uh, is making the noise. So go ahead, uh, Bobby, Joe and Ned, their son is not with us today. He, is he four now? Yep, he's four. <laughs> okay, he was on the last tour. It was great to have him, but he is occupied today so uh uh we're we're in and i will just let you uh... awesome thank you john and thank you robin and arrow and everyone for being here bobby joe and ned um we're gonna walk outside and i'll turn this so you can see and we'll follow ned so you can kind of <clears throat> see what's going on so we're in southeast south dakota have a, I don't know, a couple inches of snow on the ground. This is what our area looks like. And this is the greenhouse from the outside. Lots of snow. This is south. So that's the paneling is to the south. So it's a little windy. So Ned will give us, I'll follow that guy around so you can uh, see what's going on. This is walking in from the ground level. It's already nice and toasty warm in here. So I'll have Ned give more of the logistics of the greenhouse. These are being that uh, they're six foot apart. So usually um, this is Russ Finch's style of greenhouse. He sells kits basically that you can do. Um, usually his entryway is only 12 foot. I mean, that's just a little bit bigger than 18. So the whole structure is like uh, 96 lineal feet. So it's about 17 this way and 96 this way. So um, I think the main purpose of this room is just to, calling it an airlock is probably overly scientific, but like <laughs> it keeps the really cold air from uh, hitting everything else in there. Um, geothermal stuff like, so there's green tile, there's two separate systems and this is, yeah, I haven't really cleaned them out lately. <laughs> okay. Pressure in from the uh, outside, it takes it down six to eight feet in kind of a loop and then it pops it up back here so you get fresh air in. So this part, now we're leaving the front room which is the same level as the ground outside. And here we have kind of like a stoop and then that's a ramp. We're not ramp builders, so please forgive the, the bumpiness of it. So just so you know that, that we did this ourselves. Well, that guy, he did the building himself and did pretty great, but still working on some dirt work. So it's not completed yet, but we're still growing. Uh, so it's pretty standard to what Russ has built other than um, the south bed is usually dirt. Um, I got into aquaponics probably five or six years ago and went to a commercial course on it. And 
saw a lot of benefit in it. Like you use probably 10% the water that you would if it was soil. There's no weeding. Um, it's kind of a cool deal. So anyway, most of our growth is in the uh, aquaponic system. And then the south bed here, we just did some oh, north bed. North bed. North bed. Oh. Which is uh, popular from uh, Mel Bartholomew, the square foot gardening. So luxurious. So it's like uh, compost and vermiculite and peat moss, I think. So three ingredients that grow stuff really well. Um, I thought that Tate was on the call. Tate, look, she's doing good. A friend of ours needed to rehome his passion fruit baby. So we've got her growing in here. So we're, I feel like running a little bit behind. This is actually our second greenhouse. We built one about three years ago and got it 95% complete. I didn't have the peak on it and the door wasn't yet complete. We had like gale force winds that knocked it down. So set us back a little bit. We built this one, uh, same footprint and everything. And uh, anyway, I would have liked to have like all these trees in the ground and stuff, but we'll get there. These are all, yeah, talking about early summer trees. Yeah. So I'll talk about the plants a little bit. Um, the greenhouse itself was originally built by Rush Finch in Alliance, Nebraska. Um, if you're not familiar, look up greenhouse um, at Citrus in the Snow. I, I think you're all familiar. I feel like we should have a fan page for us. He's so amazing. But anyway, um, we've got citrus trees in here. So this one is a lemon tree. We actually got it off Facebook Marketplace. They didn't have report anymore, so we rehomed it. Look at all the little lemon babies. We're pretty excited. It's doing amazing in here. Uh, lime tree, orange tree, or lemon. Um, this one has been overwatered a little bit, and our son has been a little zealous in getting water on it. So it's perking up though, and the passion fruit vine that we are going to repot and vine in here. Um, another really cool thing we've had growing in here for a few months, and I do believe that these were here during the last tour, are these tomatoes. We've been pruning them pretty aggressively because we didn't do that at first and they took over most of the floor space in here. So they're going in the mouse mix and they are growing really, really well. We have a spigot set up in here and the soaker hoses is how we're watering those. Uh, square foot gardening is amazing. So we're trying to incorporate a few different gardening methods and experiments. Um, it was really cool. My husband, Ned, has been talking for years about wanting to have BLTs on Christmas Day from our produce, and we were able to do that this year. We harvested a tomato or a couple tomatoes and some lettuce from our aquaponic system, and we have chicken. So we were able to have a sandwich made from our produce at the end of December. It was wild. So cool. Um, we've also had ginger in here and some peppers and cucumbers are growing. Ned just planted a whole bunch of cucumbers. We've had cucumbers in here before that we pulled out. Um, they weren't doing as great. Yeah, some of the leaves don't look super healthy. I mean, it. there's no, um, really nothing for auxiliary heat. It's just solar uh, during the day. So it'll get up to 90 degrees or more on a sunny day. It's probably, take a look here. It's only about 50 degrees in here now um, at nighttime. I mean, the whole goal is just to keep it less than freezing, but I think we're learning quite a bit as we go. The tomatoes are like, yeah, a little bit warmer weather. So, um, but we still got quite a bit of fruit on the vines and stuff. So they're, I mean, coming right along. And strawberries, we pulled most of those out. Yeah, we got a few strawberries back there and you can kind of see the soaker hoses. That is the footprint of just the space down here. Just the, the so how far down all of these things are? Uh, about four, about here, four foot. That work that they're back ground level. This is our aquaponics trough. And then if you look down, we're about four feet below ground surface. We are in the plains areas and it's very flat on our property. We also have, we're also in a, a slough. So we have really high water table and we have battled flooding outside every spring, lots of snow uh, melting and just that slough area. We've got a natural pond around us. So digging it out, we were really apprehensive about the water. Uh, we didn't get any, we got a little bit of flooding in here this year just because we had so much moisture. Um, 
but otherwise we've been very privileged to have flat area to dig into and didn't have to really deal with pumping it out too much. Um, so that was really nice in terms of building the greenhouse and maintaining it. And we'll see how that goes in subsequent <coughs> We'll continue to have our citrus trees in pots just be, so I can um, control any flooding that would happen if it were to happen again um, on the floor of the well, only like the only time it's really flooded in here we had a kind of a weird thaw so I drug um, kind of like they would do in a basement around the perimeter um, below this floor level here um, kind of all the way around that hooks up to exist some existing drain tile on our property so the only time it actually flooded due to outside circumstances was this spring when it was kind of thawing and then freezing and then thawing and freezing. So I think it created just this really weird situation where, I mean, it looked like we had a river kind of flowing outside of the greenhouse. But beyond that, unless the aquaponics system overflow, we'll leave the hoses on, which I'm pretty good at forgetting to turn off. Um, if you don't get too much water in here, we can probably actually turn those off. Water on the ground here. Um, so anyway, here's the aquaponics system. Been planting all sorts of different kinds of lettuce, but uh, for those of you not familiar with aquaponics, it is a marriage of aquaculture and hydroponics. So um, I know everyone's gotta be careful about using the term organic, but like you can't really put any chemicals in it because that would either kill the fish or kill the plants. So like we don't do pesticides or anything like that. We've had some aphids and stuff, which we just have to kind of blow off with a, a stream, but like, that's what it looks like. You just plant them in net pots and it's kind of a system. I'll step you through this. It works kind of like an assembly line. So like I was out here pretty late last night, planting them into these things. And I'm kind of experimenting here, but these are from 98 cell trays. So I planted them in here. And we'll see how it works. But once they sprout, I'll just go ahead and uh, drop them in these. You can kind of see they're really close together here. And then as they start to grow, you'll space them out into bigger ones here. And then they'll just progressively get bigger. Oh, yeah. So um, I learned all that I know about aquaponics through Friendly Aquaponics. It's a couple, uh, nice family actually down in Honolulu. No, not Honolulu. Somewhere down in Hawaii. I don't remember exactly where, but they were, um, as far as I know, one of the first people to do it organically certified and like at commercial scale. So they were selling to like Costco and stuff down there, but they came up a pretty uh, cost effective way of doing this. So I mean, you just kind of keep moving down here. Um, the cool thing about this, in my opinion, is you can take these whole troughs off. Like when it's time to harvest, you just pick up this whole two by four, two foot by four foot grow bed, harvest your stuff, uh, grab another one and, and replant it basically. There's the lettuce. We got some different varieties here. Uh, I really like this. This is Batavia, I think they call it, um, which is a new variety from uh, Johnny's. It's so cool. So we'll drop that back in. I tried to. Actually, let's just harvest this one. We'll eat this. It'll be easy. Um, and then I kind of moved the strawberries around. We planted a bunch of strawberries from seed early last year. And uh, like it, it was just sending out runners like crazy. So we kind of spread them out. And then it got to the point where it was really just the ones that are like way back there. So I put all the fruiting ones together. So now they're probably overcrowded. Um, I don't always know what I'm doing, but we're trying some stuff here. But you can see it's actually growing uh, strawberries. Our son loves to come out here. Like I... I'm trying to figure out, we'll probably end up putting the strawberries into a different type of system away from this, just from a business standpoint, it makes way more sense to keep cranking out lettuce, I think, than, you know, waiting for strawberries here and there, especially if they're. And you eat some faster than you get them inside, yeah. so. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, they're, they're crazy healthy plants. You can see the roots down there. And I had heard um, in our training that there are people that were doing this 
with strawberries and you can sort of trick them, I guess. Like you can freeze them for a certain amount of time and then the crowns will start producing again. They were getting like three crops a year out of a strawberry crown, which I thought was neat. Can't validate that, but that's what I heard. And this is the fish tank. Looks kind of crud, uh, aquaponics crud. It's just kind of from having food and it's the uh, fish waste that basically powers the system here. So there's a filter that runs it down here. And then you can see this return line that runs all the way from the other end. So it's just one pump. And then usually there's bubbles and stuff in here. I turned turn some of that stuff off so you can hear us talk a little bit better. But uh, there are fish down here. They don't really hang out at the top. We use bluegill. Um, usually tilapia are used for um, aquaponics, but like, what is it? I think they like 72 degree water, which is not going to work in South Dakota that well. So uh, we've got bluegill. We thought about doing catfish. Um, and you can kind of use any kind of fish that you want, but that's uh, a different deal. And then here's where I just mixed up a bunch of coconut fiber and vermiculite, which is our potting media. That's why you can see that cement mixer down there. Um, that's kind of what I used to mix that. So. Um, Isn't that like a chest for the greenhouse? Yeah. Up here? Like show them the fans that we use here. Okay, so the uh, geothermal, I'm going to spin this around so I can actually see what you're seeing a little bit better. Um, all right, right back there, you can see that uh, fan that blows it into drain tile that goes down six to eight feet, goes all the way out there in a big loop, six foot down, eight foot down. Uh, ground temperature is usually you know, 50 to 60 degrees down there, depending on where you are. And then it comes up way down by the door there. So that just cycles it down. It works kind of like an earth battery. We keep the fan on all the time. One thing about living in a swamp, if we didn't live in uh, such a high water table, like Russ lives in uh, Sandhills in Nebraska. So, you know, he could use perforated drain tile and it was fine. Um, we had to use sealed stuff, which when you buy it at a place like Menards, I, I don't know how well sealed it always is. So like some of them uh, filled up. So I don't think our greenhouse is as efficient as um, it might be otherwise. Sorry, just fell. <laughs> now you cool. can do it, I can hold it. Uh, um, so that just warms it up, right? And we do, we recently purchased a heating fan just in case um, our greenhouse dips below freezing at night for our plants. Um, the water in the trough has stayed relatively warm, which is really awesome. This is on the south side. Uh, the Lexan for Russ's greenhouses are uh, facing the south. Ned um, shoveled off the snow off of that before the tour started. And it stays pretty warm in here, which is really amazing. Um, this material here is just a reflection material. I, I kind of like it. it reminds me of a spaceship. So if I'm really fancy full in imagination for the day, I pretend I'm in a spaceship. That's, I'm, I'm a five-year-old at heart, so it's fine. <laughs> um, and this works really nice in reflecting the sun. We have light system in here. We've been keeping that on for a couple of hours after dark just to give our plants um, that extra sunlight. And Russ has lights in on his amazing tropical plants. I forgot that we had onions in here. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, about all. Yeah. So questions or anything? Yeah, last, last thing I'll mention, uh, since it'll maybe come up in questions anyway, the water has been consistently, without heat, again, um, 45 to 55, I guess. It does fluctuate some, but I think the thermal mass of the water, because um, there's quite a bit. Don't ask me gallons, please, because like I <laughs> have that written down somewhere, but I don't remember. Big tank, and then all of this, like I think, keeps it much warmer than it would be in the wintertime anyway. Um, the fish behave a little bit differently. Like they're a lot more lively in the summer times. It's just like anything else. But uh, yeah, it's just air pumps, water pumps. That's about it. So anyway, tired of hearing myself talk. So <laughs> hit me with some questions. <laughs> Well, thanks. Uh, and there's a lot more, a uh, lot more to this than uh, what we've seen so far. And 
Now, one of the one of the things that I'm curious about is what kind of system, if you have one, uh, have you set up to monitor things, uh, you know, like your highs and lows, the, uh, how much, what kind of turnaround you have for your for your lettuce, and uh, <clears throat> you know, you already mentioned the water temperature. And I would imagine you measure the nutrients in the water, uh, yeah. or yeah. Uh, so a few things, and I think there's probably ways to automate this. I kind of dream about having, like, with the Internet of Things, there's ways to, for example, if I forget the water's on, like, you could have a sensor that would tell you that, or like if the filter gets plugged up, um, you know, something that would automatically alert you to that. We do get some alerts, so like if it hits a certain temperature in here or something, I can set that. Let's see if I can find it from over here. Uh, you can't really see it. I've got it tucked back behind that fan there, but there's this really small device called a UV bot, U B I B O T, um, which will uh, it monitors light that you're getting, it monitors temperature uh, of the air, humidity. Um, I bought a couple extra probes, so that's how I tell my water temperature. And then, yeah, aquaponics, you should be testing according to the training I did daily. Like we've been a little bit lazier than that, but um, everything seems to be doing fine. Basically want to check, you know, your ammonia level, um, which goes up and down with how much you feed your fish more or less. And then uh, nitrites, which you don't want too many of, uh, or nitrates, but the nitrifying bacteria, bacteria that you add to the water will turn the nitrates, to, or excuse me, nitrites to nitrates which is what the plants eat. So um, it's a pretty pretty easy system that kind of takes care of itself. Like the, you feed the plants, or excuse me, you feed, feed the uh, fish, the fish feed the plants and the plants clean the water. Um, and we haven't had to add anything yet. Sometimes, you know, if your pH can get out of whack, you can add like chelated iron and stuff to, to fix some of that stuff. But yeah, that's about it for monitoring, I think. And that's how they have those apps on our phone that monitor and record all of the temperature fluctuations and give those alerts, which is really nice. Um, turnaround for lettuce has been pretty interesting. The system that Ned has set up uh, is producing about, we expect about 100 mature heads of lettuce a week with the system that, um, the system of planting and rotating them down the line. And it's been really awesome because we haven't seen any nutritional deficiencies. And I talked about the aphids a little bit. We've been battling them with ladybugs and tried out some praying mantises and just kind of spraying them off. So it's been really awesome. We had lettuce here in the summertime. And I think we had lettuce planted with our last Zoom tour with you, John, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it grew so efficiently that it was too efficient. It got way too hot in here, right by that Lexan in the Southern sun that it grew too fast for us to keep up with. So I don't think we'll plant lettuce in here again in the summertime. Uh, we'll fill it in with something else. We're thinking about rotating the strawberries through the system because we need the plant mass to be able to keep the levels for the aquaponics sufficient for the plants and the fish. Um, so the, the lettuce grows so very nicely in here it's nice and crisp and juicy and we haven't had any issues selling it so that's kind of nice we're still figuring out exactly how we'll do that um i think from a, a timing standpoint if that's your question it's not a lot different than during the summer months um i added these led lights up top which are not fancy beyond them being leds like they're not grow variety or anything like that but I mean, we're in the shortest part of the year right now so uh Usually, like I'll leave mine for a couple extra hours at night or whatever, and I don't know if that helps. Frankly, it's just something that I do. Um, but we're still getting them, and pretty close to the recommended time is you know 55, 60 days. Um, some of them will let go, grow a little bit longer, and yeah. Did I miss any of the questions there? Well, I had one uh, uh, in the. I don't know if you have done any bricks testing of the sugar content of uh, of the of the produce that you're going in with. Uh, have not 
would be interested in doing that, I guess. I always thought it'd be kind of cool to, you know, because what I've learned about aquaponics is just all what the folks that trained me at it said, but they're like, you know, it's more nutritious, shelf life's longer, um, all sorts of stuff, which like, if you're training people in aquaponics, I could understand why uh, you claim all those things. So like, I can't validate any of it, but yeah, I would love to, like, I would imagine um, if you put this up against lettuce that comes from Mexico or, you know, wherever they ship it in from, it's probably going to be pretty good. Yeah. But uh, and that was what I was wondering about. Yeah. Uh, but if you've got resources on where to test it or how, um, well, you can, there's really a little, cool. a little device. There's just a, a refactometer uh, that, you can easily use yourself and I uh, um, it's called, called a bricks meter um, and uh, they're they're readily available they don't cost much 50 bucks I think or something like that and okay you can do this side by side with a you know a, a head of lettuce you get in town and one one of yours and see what the because that's kind of a it's a rough nutrient density test okay <clears throat> hey John. Yeah. This is Robin. I have about 10 questions that have come in the chat box. They're all short data questions. I'm just wondering if I could run through them and yeah, go ahead. Answered. Okay. So, you know, they should be quickly quick for you to answer you guys to answer them. One is I'm going to go backwards. Do you cover the reflective material in the summer? We do not. Okay. Have not. Um our lettuce got pretty bitter midsummer, as we mentioned though. So Maybe not a bad idea to have some sort of shade cloth. But. I think we'll mm -hmm. add that on the Lexan if we do do lettuce um, on the, for the summertime. So. Mm -hmm. and then yeah, it's our first, it was our first summer basically too. So um, anyway, we haven't. Maybe, maybe should. That's a great question. Good question. Yeah, the, re the reflective and, and surface on the north wall doesn't get hit by the sun in the summertime though. So, so it wouldn't really do a whole lot there. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get your a lot of reflection now when you want it. Yep. So nice. Um, so on that note, um, we had a question on a asking for more information on how you insulate the north wall. Uh, we just did spray foam insulation. Like I think the first time we built it, Russ has gone through several different iterations of like continually making the structure better. Um, it used to just be two inch. Uh, foam board and then another one inch foam board kind of in between the beams but you can see up there it's the same as back here basically it's just the spray foam insulation i think we did must have been about two inches of it okay uh so yeah that was something we had a, a gentleman come in and do for us most of the structure we dug out and did ourselves um with help of friends and family but we hired a gentleman to come in and spray foam all of that. Okay. And so we've we've got a number of questions about the water. One of them is, you know, what's the current temperature now, which you may have may have not answered. And uh, also, what's the minimum temperature that that you know both the fish and the plants can handle, and what's the maximum, and what's the ideal? Uh, <laughs> great, great questions. I make that noise because, like, I don't know. You'll find out a lot of what we do out here is just kind of trial and error and like, you'll get a lot of, I don't know, like see if it works, but um, it's about 50 degrees right now, 50.2. I'm looking at the UB bot app on my phone here. Um, so yeah, last three days, the minimum has been 48 degrees. Uh, the hottest it's been is 52.2. So like I'd say freezing is too cold, um, but I don't know the absolute minimum that we've hit. Like I, I doubt it's gone much below maybe 45 degrees or something like that, which, you know, fish just metabolism will slow down a little bit. Like if you're growing lettuce, I don't think they care. It's probably part of the reason that, um, you know, I used to sprout the uh, tomato plants in here. So you just cut a sucker off and then drop it right in the net pot. And like during the summer months, roots would just pop out like it, it almost didn't matter where you took the cutting from the um tomato plant but it loved it but once the temperature dropped i'm guessing water and air temp like that kind of quit happening anyway i don't know if i answered the question there but uh and this is the first uh that we know of system of one of russ's greenhouses that has an aquaponic system in it 
So we are kind of the test dummies for that, um, which is really exciting and really fun. So if we, we don't have all of those answers quite yet, but uh, we've worked with aquaponic systems outside in our basement, in our garage, in different settings and different sizes. Um, so this is our first winter in the greenhouse, the aquaponics really pumping stuff out. So it was a really great question. Thank you. Yeah, let us let us okay. see if you love yeah. it in here. And then remind us again, um, what what are the fish that you were using and, and and how you got to the decision to pick those fish? Um, yeah, so again, most aquaponics that you read about is tilapia, but they like, you know, to be real active, they like water to be 72 degrees or more. Um, we're fortunate enough to live within an hour or so of a, a place that sells all kinds of different fish. So we could have done anything from walleye to perch to uh, bass. I settled on bluegill. bluegill. It's hybrid bluegill, actually, if that matters much. But um, we're thinking about catfish too. We just went with that because as I did research, it seemed like the food to weight conversion ratio was a little bit better with hybrid bluegill than a lot of the other things out there. So which is a, probably the same reason that so many people use tilapia. Like they just convert food much more efficiently. So, you know, if you're doing aquaponics, right, you should be harvesting fish to eat. We haven't done that yet. They're just not big enough, but they've been in there probably eight months or so is all right now. So any kind of fish that, okay. um, that you can eat um, is kind of nice That's for that self-sustaining system that makes it more efficient for some folks. Could, could you repeat that, Bobby Joe? You were a little muted. Oh, sorry. Um, I think that many folks do the tilapia because it's a very edible fish for folks. Uh, we did bluegill. My husband doesn't mind the taste of it. I think they're, they're okay. So I think any kind of edible fish is great. We have um, goldfish in our aquaponics system in our kitchen. Obviously, I'm not going to eat them, but they work for the aquaponics. So. On that note, um, I don't know if you're selling your fish or not or planning to, but a question came in about when you expect your ROI timeline to be. And I don't know if you're calculating that based on just the plants or fish or what. Yeah, I guess um, I'd have to look since the first one blew down, I'm like several years removed from when I actually did all those calculations. So, um, like the way that I penciled it out when we ended up getting a um, USDA or F F SA loan, um, we just did an operating loan to get all the stuff to build it and whatnot. And I found the time to, to put it all together. I mean, I, th I think it was set to be profitable within the first two years um, relatively quickly, the way that I had kind of penciled it out. But uh, with the initial disaster and kind of a lot of trial and error stuff out here, just figuring out what works. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that, honestly. Okay. Um, okay, a uh, question came in about, um, do you use liners to protect the uh, wood uh, in your beds? This one we have a liner in for the aquaponics. You can like, see this. I mean, down here it's pond liner. Obviously, you're not going to have water right up against the wood. And then, uh, yeah, all of the wood that we use, this is like a little bit more heavy duty since the first one blew down. It kind of, everything got wet and our old retaining walls collapsed. But like, we probably put more into this than we needed to. Russ usually has smaller beams and then he'll even do like a pro rip siding, just steel siding to kind of hold stuff. Uh, we went real heavy duty the second time because I didn't want it coming down. So these are like 10 foot six by six, six by sixes that are, you know, that deep into the ground and then um, treated, what are they, two by 12s or two by 16s uh, all the way down. Um, and then, yeah, I just did like, a, I had the liner laying around here somewhere. It's just kind of like a landscape liner, I guess, um, on the inside. And I did that more than any, I guess, protecting the wood is probably a nice extra point of it, but you can kind of see these gaps here. I guys did it so it'd keep the soil from seeping out of there when we're watering it. Okay. Um, uh, do you have an air intake cover to keep rodents and pests insects out? An air intake? Oh. Some kind of a cover. Oh, sure. Yeah, on the outside we do. Um, and I guess I didn't think about rodents and stuff, but yeah. Um, 
we just kind of put a cap over it that'll still allow it to breathe. I did it more just so it wouldn't fill up with water since again, ours are non-perforated. Um, if they're perforated, the water would just kind of seep through them. But since we live in a swamp, we couldn't really do that. So yeah, it's just got a cap on on the outside, I guess. Okay. Uh, another question was, um, is your lighting to keep the solar system warm? No, I went with LEDs just for efficiency's sake. Like, I don't think they put off much of anything for heat. But that is a good idea. Russ has some, um, like the grow light type things on some of his more, we'll call them needy plants <laughs> that need a little bit more heat. And um, we could replace those with them. And some of the plants we might need to do that, suspend some uh, more of the heat um, lamps. From that, not natural heat lamp, but they're lamp, they're lighting that put off heat. So these ones don't really. Um, it would be nice though, but so far it's been so good with just these. What's the number of solar days you guys have there? Uh, probably a better Google question. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Okay. And you're southeast of where? Where are you relative to Sioux Falls? Sioux Falls is two miles north of us, basically. Okay, so we could Google Sioux Falls. Thank you okay. for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question came in about, do you worry about mold growth in the tubes? Uh, I guess, yeah, great question. No, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, it seems like people had asked that to Russ um, and I kind of asked the same thing and he's like, I don't know, like hasn't, hasn't really been an issue for whatever reason. So um, yeah, if it happens, I guess I'll probably be a little bit more freaked out about it, but. Watch us in 40 years and see how our lungs are doing that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then this is the last question in our- I wanna, in I wanna our... jump in on the mold, mold thing too. I remember Russ talking about uh, one of the, the things about this kind of, of structure is that the temperature fluctuates a lot every day. That's right. So you get 30, 40 degrees change in temperature and mold doesn't like that. It pretty much likes a steady temperature. And, yep. uh, yeah. So that was, that was his explanation for why he doesn't have a lot of the problems that a, a regular greenhouse that we're familiar with that has you know, 80 degrees and 80% humidity all the time uh, has all kinds of problems um, that, that just aren't, aren't there because of the structure and design of it. Although I don't think they were designing it for that purpose. That's just what, what has happened. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good point. There's huge temperature swing almost every day. Like the reason it's actually comfortable in here right now. It's like a nice 50 degrees, but you probably saw how overcast it was outside. If it was straight um, straight sunlight, like it was yesterday, like it was hot in here, uh, 90 degrees or something, so. Uh, last question from the chat box is, where do you source your fish food? And what is it? Oh. Um, good question. It's, I don't know, I've just been using stuff that I got a deal on. Like I went to TSC, uh, Tractor Supply in Sioux Falls and they happen to have like a pallet of this stuff just kind of sitting there. And they're like, yeah, someone threw it on their own truck. So I said, okay, great. Like, can I get a deal on it? And uh, yeah, they probably sold it to me at cost or maybe even less than that. So I ended up getting half a pallet of this floating pond and catfish food, which you've got a TSC in your area. You can order it through them. Fleet Farm sells similar stuff. Um, there's probably higher quality food. And I think once I run through this, I'll, I'll start ordering, uh, some other stuff that's more highly recommended. Um, the only difference is like the, from, as I understand the amount of filler and stuff that they put in it. So like, you know, I gotta clean my filters a little bit more frequently than I would otherwise. Um, the fish probably process a higher quality feed a little bit better than they would this, but it's getting the job done. It's growing, growing food for us. So. Great. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
I had a couple of questions here, um, you know, with, about the why. Why are you doing this? Uh, I love that question. We both grew up kind of growing food with our families, and it was important to us to have our own gardens. Ned was introduced to aquaponics probably eight, seven, eight years ago. We lived in a little house in town. So we built a big system there and thought it was really amazing. And his uncle Gary had worked at the University of Nebraska, right? And had heard of Russ's greenhouse. And I think he might have helped with the engineering at one point for the system. Uh, no, he did not. Ned is he said no. So Gary uh, was familiar with Russ and brought it up to Ned. Um, and that was what started this all. Just the idea of having a greenhouse from which we could produce food year round sustainably. And we wanted to combine the aquaponics with the greenhouse to make it even more sustainable and more efficient because we love the aquaponics system and the greenhouse is clearly really amazing being able to grow anything year round awesomely. So um, from a farming standpoint, just for our family, I grow a lot of food outdoors. I grow a lot of our food and we have chickens. So being able to provide food for our family around has been really amazing, but also being able to provide other people with food, local food, locally sustained, sustainable food at a lower cost, I think is really amazing. And I love Russ's idea of wanting these greenhouses all over the place, especially in food desert areas. We've, uh, there's the greenhouse in Porcupine, I believe. Right, John, I think Porcupine on the reservation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is bringing food sovereignty to those folks who are not in an area that they can grow food really easily any time of year. So it's really awesome that Russ has this idea of having food production available anywhere, any climate, any time. And I think that was really amazing to be able to tap into and kind of have the experimental aquaponics uh, geothermal greenhouse combination. So it's been really awesome. Yeah, I just kind of stumbled across uh, both of them. Like my uncle, had, I think he told me to look up greenhouse in the snow. And uh, I saw what Russ was doing. And this is probably, I don't know, seven years ago or more. Um, drove out to Alliance, which is a little bit of a haul from, from Sioux Falls. And, you know, it was a day much like this, overcast, really cold. And stepping in there um, and holding these, like, gigantic lemons in your hand uh oh it's just kind of like walking into paradise like on a cold day so i thought that was super cool and the fact that really the only energy input for him was uh you know a couple fans basically uh i thought was really groundbreaking and had a lot of potential to kind of change the world so to speak and then i got interested in aquaponics kind of in that same way where uses much less water than uh, traditional farming. Like it always kind of blew my mind that to get a, a head of lettuce or, you know, most thing that we buy in the winter time, like it travels however many miles, the amount of fossil fuels that go into that. You know, I'd like to get to a point where we've got like a Tesla battery or windmill or, you know, a way to kind of power all of the electric stuff going on in here, which isn't like a, a lot of input anyway, but yeah, Bobby touched on it a little bit. Like I, I think combining the two technologies you could solve a lot of problems in um, third world countries in food deserts. I mean, you could be talking about a, an urban area in the middle of America, uh, Detroit or somewhere, you know, dig a hole, a uh, couple holes in a abandoned parking lot and like throw these up and you've got, got the ability to feed a lot of people and, and have food that's local and right there. Um, I like and yeah, I could, I could probably write like a, a essay on the why and like why it's exciting and stuff but those are kind of the high level i like that Russ. um there's a greenhouse in the school um in alliance where rust is located and they have the kids and the teachers working in this greenhouse feeding those um the kids there with their greens and things i think that's really amazing and something that we've looked into doing in our area um there's a lot that goes into that weirdly enough but it's uh it's really exciting uh, prospect of having fresh greens year-round for our kids or hospitals or anything like that um, that is produced locally and sustainably so there's a lot so much potential in it and it's really exciting it's so bittersweet because I'm more of a, a soil conservation nerd um, 
So it's kind of hard for me. I, I feel like I'm cheating on my outdoor space, working up the soil there and building up the soil. And I come in here, I'm like, no weeds, this is amazing. Uh, so not ignoring the fact that you really need to work on soil conservation and building that up um, while also offering an alternative to food production that is sustainable. So it's been really amazing seeing this process and seeing other people build them. I think we both get so excited when we meet other people who want to build them or have built them. And John, I think you know more about this greenhouse than we do. So it's always amazing <laughs> talking to you. I absolutely love hearing all of you about this. Yeah, awesome. I, I, I don't have any experience uh, in this particular style, but uh, uh, you know, a lot of curiosity and I talk to people and uh, like you and, and observe and it's really fun and I know uh, a couple of things about you that you haven't told about uh, so much here at this stage uh, and but one of the one of my questions as I was making notes this morning I was wondering do you have a name for your greenhouse yet? Oh we don't we named our farm Nom Nom Gardens um, oh, okay I, I talked earlier about being like a five-year-old so I call food Nom Noms and Ned, Ned has laughed at that for quite some time. So when we needed to name our farm, we called it Nom Nom Gardens because we grow food in different growing yeah. areas. Uh, we don't have a name for our greenhouse specifically, but our farm name is Nom Nom Gardens. Yeah, okay. And, and you also have some other uh, enterprises on the, on the farm uh, as well. So this is not just a you know, just a greenhouse that's stuck out in the middle of nowhere. It's part of a growing system that you're developing. Yep. So I've got about an acre of ingrown uh, traditional farming. Um, so I do outdoor growing in that space. And we also run an event venue out of a big pole shed that we have here. So we have a beer and wine license and we do events and about 120 free range chickens, give or take a couple foxes and coyotes here and there. Um, so we sell eggs, do the events, have the outdoor produce, and um, we plan on adding some fiber animals in the next few years. Alpacas and llamas are a dream come true for me, and it'd be really neat to be even more, you know, self-sufficient in the meat production out here um, and fiber production. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm not a farmer by trade. I'm an anthropologist and psychologist. I do therapy and just... Um, trying not to kill everything. I have a green thumb, so it's been fun. Yeah. So what, in your therapy orientation, what does is, what is this greenhouse and your gardens and stuff do for that? It has been really, I mean, for me, therapeutic. And I've also had some clients come out um, and just be in the space, do green stuff. I do a lot of bartering from our farm and any other business venture we have. Any bartering system that we can get a part of, I think is really cool. Monetary stuff is is what it is. We live in a you know monetary based capitalistic society, but um, I've had people barter us stuff and trade things. So I've had folks come out and help me weed outside to have me listen to them. So I think it's kind of cool. And I'm really excited for the, um, for the greenhouse space and to set up a therapy area office in the open, um, that first room we walked into because it's so nice and toasty warm in there. So it'd be cool to have clients come and just be warm and be surrounded by plants and probably a barn cat that will run in here and let them cuddle. So that's been awesome, but it's a, it's really amazing. And what's kind of cool about the greenhouse is versus outside gardening stuff. I can leave it for a couple of days and I'm not, I don't have to worry about everything going haywire. It's pretty self-sufficient. Uh, obviously the fish need to be fed, but you can get automatic feeders like we have in our indoor fish tank for our aquaponics in our kitchen. Um, and same with the automatic waters and uh, light systems. We don't have those, we're not that fancy yet, but you can get them, which is really <laughs> cool. And I think that's really amazing about this system is it's so self-sufficient. And unless something really bad happens, we wouldn't have to worry about a lot. I saw a question pop up about wind. This does amazing with wind once it's completed. <laughs> The first one we built, we didn't have uh, the ridge cap or the end caps on it. And we had, as Neil said, or Ned said, really, really bad spring storm. The wind came up and it just kind of split. It was kind of like a clamshell almost. It kind of split right down the middle. And uh, the Luxian up there, which is the plastic part, it split from that and it just kind of opened up like a clam. So. 
I seem to remember in our last conversation that uh, that Lexan was uh, was not destroyed. Is it that right? Is, or... It is looking really good. Like there are a couple pieces that we probably wouldn't use because it was so like it, I don't know. But you yeah, think we could probably reuse all of it, really? Uh, maybe half of it. Maybe half. I mean, of some it. of it got some of it got blown up and. Uh, it's just weird how storms yeah. uh, destroy things, you know? Like, some of it seemed fine. Some of it definitely did not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was curious, uh, and it, probably the temperature swing wouldn't wouldn't allow for that, but if you thought about geckos or frogs or anything like that in, in there for your insect stuff. I've definitely thought about frogs, and I hadn't thought about geckos. That's a really good idea. Um, but frogs, I've definitely thought of. We've had some in here naturally, which is kind of nice. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I heard one. My son was trying to find it. Of course, I mean, kids and frogs are pretty, pretty great pairs. So I yeah, think that's a great idea. You'll see. Uh, at least this summer, we saw toads and stuff like that, kind of just hanging out in here. Before we got our system complete completed, yeah. mm -hmm. um, they were able to hop on in here, and I think it's a great idea to add them. We added the beneficial insects like ladybugs, and we had tried out um, a praying mantis nest sack, but um, I think it was overrun by some ants that we had, so that was unfortunate. So we'll try that again, but I think the toads, any other insect I think would be amazing in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and so, you know, for people who are not so familiar with Russ's uh, Russ's stuff, what what's the uh, if you only do it once, what's the outlay of capital for getting something like this started? I saw yeah. Robin put something like that in the on uh, the comments. Do you remember what it was for ours specifically? Really hard to tell. I mean, like. I think just materials, I'd probably ballpark it. And this may, has, may have changed like with the price of metal increasing. And I think the price of Lexion is connected to petroleum or something, but um, the loan that we ended up going with was about 25K and that covered most of the, most of the material for it. Um, but we also, you know, and a mini excavator if you're going to do that yourself um, we ended up getting a laser like there's a bunch of other things that that kind of go into it but um, I think the big cost is like are you capable of doing it yourself I had the thankfully I had my dad who's real handy um, around to help me with a lot of the the stuff that I needed help with out here um, the materials that Russ sells and he has manufactured are the framing so the metal part and the Lexan, right? In the posts and everything else, the wood, you kind of get to choose on your own. So that will also go into the cost of what you're building. Um, like Ned had talked about earlier, our first greenhouse looked a lot different than this. We didn't have any of the wood, uh, but that was kind of a disaster for us. So we made sure that it's not going anywhere. <laughs> There's no moving of our reuse beds or anything like that. So it's kind of neat that a lot of the greenhouses that uh, people have built from Russ look a little different in the inside, depending on the materials that they've used, which is also kind of nice for people's individual budgets. So um, yeah. our first one costs a lot different than the second one, but. Yeah, I'd say like, and Robin had, had put something in the chat there, but that's probably pretty accurate if you're talking just materials, um, whether or not you hire stuff done is one thing. Like, I don't think I added the spray foam insulation, which is probably another couple grand to get in front of my spreadsheets to actually tell you like you know aquaponics i just kind of figured separately um to the cost so i don't know 25 yeah. 30 maybe mm -hmm. and so what uh now that you've now you've got all this experience under your belt um what are some of the visions that are emerging about what's what's next i don't imagine you people are going to be satisfied with what is you're really looking at you know what what else? What else can we do now that we've got this? We've gone this far. I'm interested to continue to scale the aquaponics specifically. Like, I feel like we're finally to a point where we're planting on a regular basis. You know, if we plant every week, then we can harvest every week. And then, uh, you know, I think that tomato or the strawberries are taking up a lot of space here, which would cut into any return on investment that we're looking to get. Um, 
I built a really cool vertical aquaponic system out of like, I think it's four inch PVC. Um, and then it just kind of snakes around and drops into another one. So there's like five or six layers to it. Um, so I would just do those like every so often back here with citrus trees in between them. And like, we could get a lot more uh, out of it. I think, you know, if you're looking at greenhouse economics, it's all about dollars per square foot, um, both on cost and on, you know, potential return there. And like, as you can see, we have a lot of wasted space in here right now that's not growing stuff. So, um, so that's, trees in South Dakota are hard to come by. So. <laughs> that's, that's probably the next step. And then, you know, I always thought, I think anytime you build something like this, you're like, ah, maybe, you know, maybe I do it a little bit differently this way or that way. So maybe we put aquaponics on that side or, you know, maybe I'd increase the cost significantly and do concrete walls um, all the way to the ground. And then that way, if we do entirely aquaponics, it would be much easier and you'd have a lot more room to, to kind of push stuff around if you've got them on carts. But I don't know, I guess some some potential ideas there. I'm excited yeah. to build more uh, growing space and get into like farm to school stuff and talking to the community about building these within our community um, for kids or for hospitals and things like that and get um, that type of thing going. There's really great groups all over the place working with local foods and everything like that. And um, it would be really nice to get that going and get another one for um, more food production like on a bigger scale. Right now we have all this empty space that will fill up with more citrus trees and other things like that. And a lot of this is feeding our family. So I really wanna build more to be able to feed more of the community and have it be something that is more affordable and sustainable for our community members to purchase food locally year round. That's not moldy. That's what I love most about the strawberries is uh, when, you know, if I can get any away from my son before he eats them all, uh, we'd be able to sell them to other family members or for other families and community and uh, kind of experiment, keep experimenting on what is uh, most efficient and helping other people build these also and um, kind of acting as Russ's minions, so to speak, and raising awareness about how amazing these are. I really love it. I love having our farm be a teaching tool. Uh, we give a, a many tours, you know, COVID has kind of put that on hold, obviously, um, but I love teaching people where their food comes from, and it's been really great being able to use this as another way of teaching that, so it's yeah. been a lot of fun, I like it. Yeah, great. Uh, I, I uh, sent an email to Russ with the, with the uh, notice that we were doing this and asked him if he wanted to pop in. Uh, uh, but he did, he, and I don't think he's here, but uh, he did uh, send me a little bit of information about what the current status of the greenhouses are. And, uh, and he said that, you know, this time last year, there were about 50 of them around the uh, different parts of the country and the continent and maybe a few others in some other parts of the world. Um, but since since you know the beginning of this year now they're up to uh this year uh, i think 150 new ones yeah he's been selling them like crazy when we went down to get the material for this um i mean it seemed like selling almost exponentially more uh yeah. every year it was uh pretty cool yeah and, they, and he is imagining that it could very easily double this year as well um, yep. Uh, and, you know, they have uh, uh, someone in France, I think, who is manufacturing the, the doing the, the uh, structural stuff there and uh, doing basically what he's doing. And maybe somebody up in Alberta or someplace in, in Canada as well. Um, so, and you know he's an he's an amazing guy as you guys as you uh, both uh, communicate very very nicely and and you know he's just going to do this until it, it with until he's reached his last heartbeat and 
and what a life, you know. What is he, 86 or 87 now? Yeah. Sounds uh, about right. Yeah. And just going on and on and, and loves what he's doing and is just doing it because he thinks that it is a big answer to a lot of the problems that we have and a lot of like the food deserts that you're talking about. And uh, it's really exciting uh, for, for those of us who have caught the bug. Uh, you know, what a thing to be infected by uh, is this enthusiasm. <laughs> for... <laughs> uh. um, I... Oh, Robin says, sir, good. Uh, um, I so two things. I don't know how long we were planning to do this session, so I'm happy to stay on. And I just want to let people know we've gone an hour, so just wanted to provide that data. Also, um, Bobby, Joe, and Ned, uh, you have you appear to have more sun days of sunshine than we do in Montana. And I'm just curious, based on your experience, if you had fewer days or more overcast days, particularly in the winter time, what, what might you do or consider doing to compensate, if anything? Yeah, um, so last year with just the geothermal running, I think we did actually, and this is before we had a lot of stuff growing, like basically we got it covered and you know insulated and everything right before winter time last year. Um, we had a cold snap, like sub-zero weather for almost two weeks, overcast skies and everything. So that's when it did dip below freezing a couple of times. Um, I think actually I actually just bought this this week, um, looking at the weather and kind of concerned now that we have a lot more things going on, uh, whether or not it might be an issue. But I think this is made for greenhouses that are probably like a third the size, but it's like a bio green heater so it's an electric heat but it's supposedly really low energy consumption so i have that kick on if we get real close to um freezing in here like if it gets down to 35 or something i'll have a kick on so probably that hopefully i don't need another one or two of those or find out the hard way but i think that's about all that you can do and then i don't know maybe leave the lights on a little bit longer perhaps i still don't really know whether or not that's helping the growth but I guess it makes me feel good to have them on for a couple extra hours a day when we're getting much less daylight. There are, um, if we needed to, um, that was called our polar vortex last year. It was so terribly cold. There are tank heaters that you can throw into aquaponic systems um, that operate a little bit differently than like the coil heaters I have in um, like the waters I have for my chickens that are safe for aquaponic systems. They're more, in, they're completely enclosed that we could put in there. I think that hopefully we won't need to we have had aquaponic systems outside only in the summertime, but those do exist if we needed to have that. And we'll update that if anybody has questions about it um, as that time comes, but um, we'll have to, that experiment will be in, ex hopefully not exciting in a bad way one. <laughs> Obviously we don't want our fish to freeze or anything like that, but if we needed to, there are heaters that you could throw into the tank that would keep that from freezing, but it shouldn't because of the warmth of the greenhouse. Yeah, great. great. Um, what I, I'm curious, uh, so you're, if you had access to all the trees that you wanted to have in there, how many would there be and what would they be? Oh man, I would have all of them. <laughs> I am a plant hoarder. So inside our house, it, it, it drives Ned crazy. People walk in and they're like, oh, it's like a jungle in here. And it kind of is. Um, I love plants everywhere. So I love the idea of citrus trees like Russ has. We had talked to a few farmers maybe three years ago um, that with Russ. Uh, I, I don't remember which town we were in, just west of Sioux Falls about starting a citrus growers association in South Dakota. So we would love to be able to do that um, and help other growers that are not close to Sioux Falls have more of a hub to be able to sell their produce and have that co-op type thing. So definitely citrus, I think more for the, ah, we have citrus in South Dakota, same thing. Um, and I'm thinking of just experimenting with all sorts of stuff. Our friend Tate, who I believe is still on the call, I don't know how to check that, he is a, a super plant nerd. He's amazing. Kate, you're great. He needed to, um, he moved and we are now housing his 
uh, passion fruit vine. And I'm excited to experiment with more of that. Um, square foot for trees, we could probably fit, you know, yeah, Ned, do you know how many trees we could fit in here? I don't even know. But we, I'm hoping for at least 12 citrus, lemon, lime, oranges, maybe grapefruit. But those citrus trees, you know, they're so, here we can get them at like Hy-Vee or someplace else, our grocery stores and weird parts of the year. And you can get them at the greenhouses, but we'll order them from uh, greenhouses and they'll come in the spring. So We'll experiment with the citrus. I also want to do fig trees and um, maybe some ornamental trees. Uh, I love walking into Russ's greenhouse and seeing all of the tropical plants that he has. He has kiwi and grapefruit, oranges, the citrus trees, and a lot of other really cool plants. I'm really excited. We recently, finally, uh, one dream of mine has been to grow vanilla. I'm a really big orchid lover and I have probably 30 or 40 just regular orchids in our house. So I finally got some vanilla bean orchids. So I've got those in our house for right now, but I'm pretty excited about that because vanilla in South Dakota would be even more mind blowing. Um, I don't know if I'm brave enough to put them in the greenhouse right now because of the dense in temperature. Our house you know, stays pretty much the same and I've got a humidifier going, so they're safer in there. Um, but at some point, I might put them in here. My growing philosophy is I work with nature. Outside, I don't do a lot of irrigation. We don't do a lot of weeding. We don't do spraying. And I try to make the same in the greenhouse. As efficient and working with the greenhouse, we'll call it nature as possible. So trying not to find things that grow efficiently in here and sustainably. Um, so I don't know if vanilla will be it, but I might try it. I don't It's it's hard. They're kind of my babies now, so we'll see if I move them in here, but just kind of experimenting with whatever. And that's spraying off some lettuce, and it just amazes me, you know, being in South Dakota, and I don't know if you can hear that crisp, probably not. I don't know how to do that, but it's very crispy and juicy, and yeah. Cool. More lettuce. We'll do more greens, which has been really, um, really awesome, because one thing with aquaponics is the lack of nutrients. Um, the fear of lack of nutrients that some plants need. And I haven't found any nutritional deficiencies within our lettuce or the strawberries. I was kind of surprised with strawberries and I'm not seeing more um, need for them to have some nutritional um, supplements, but so far it's been good because you can't really do that in an aquaponic system. It's not as easy as the soil where I need to fix, you know, the pH or anything like that. And I'll go, oh, it's just a little different. But... I try yeah. to do things as smoothly as possible. Yeah, well, um, uh, I could stay on for a couple more hours, but I think that, uh, well, uh, unless there are more questions, are there more questions, uh, Robin? Um, not in our chat box. Okay, uh, and then uh, how about uh, just a couple of closing thoughts, uh, Bobby and Ned? Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, John, for setting it up. Thank you, Robin and Errol, for doing this. I am always so thankful and excited. I always get teary at this point. Forgive me. <laughs> it's really a big privilege to have this space and have the privilege of um, having one of these greenhouses and sharing Russ's uh, big dream with the world. It's been really cool, and it's not something that's lost on us. It's very cool. So I'm very thankful that this is the second time you've given your time, John, to us and giving this fur and sharing this space with others. And thank you so much for letting us be here with you all today and taking your time to be here. Yeah, I guess the one thing that, that I thought of <clears throat> when we first decided we we're going to start like producing food and, you know, maybe building one of these greenhouses or whatever. We ran into a number of people that do uh, local stuff around here and not all of them were friendly with like, you know, oh God, here's another competitor. Um, so I'm just here to say like, take whatever, uh, hopefully we were able to share that's helpful and run with it. Like, I'd love to see these things everywhere. Uh, you know, big ag is a, is a beast of battle and I don't think it's a battle that can be won unless we're all kind of working together in some way, so. Thanks for having us. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for this. And 
uh, I think that the uh, next solstice, we should do another one. I would love that. Absolutely. We just planted, Ned just planted a bunch of cucumbers. So um, oh. I'm sure we've got some pictures from when we did our tour with you in June. It'd be fun to see what it looks like then. And we'll have more trees and more goodies. Things would be a little bit more pruned then. I also don't prune plants very well. I, I kind of want to do its thing. It's like my hair. I don't do a lot with it. I don't cut it. I just let it go. So <laughs> pretty wild around here and exciting. So thank you so much. And John, thanks for your never ending advocacy for everything, food production and sustainability. It's really awesome. Thank you so much for letting us do this. It's been great. We're not the yeah. best of all the time, but we appreciate all of the great questions and I'm excited to see what answers we can give in June and yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, great. Thanks uh, everyone for showing up. Uh, just a, uh, you know, a reminder that, uh, you know, Arrow is a, uh, an organization, a grassroots organization that can use support. And uh, Robin has put in the chat how you could do that uh, if you want to. And just showing up here is one of the best ways to uh, support the work that Arrow is doing uh, just by showing your interest. And, and uh, so keep that up and uh, let's get more of these growing. More of these greenhouses going, having local nutrient dense year round food um, is, is, a, is where it's at as far as I'm concerned. So thanks everyone. Thank you for Thank sharing. You so much, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay. Um, John, before I close out, I'm going to go ahead and um, just put this, your resources on slides on the, you know, so, but you feel free to, to leave if you wish. Okay. <laughs> uh, but we can also chat while I'm doing that. Yeah. So I'm doing that now. And um, I thought it went really well. Uh, oops. Except that I never know how to do the next thing. Um, yeah. definitely seems to be much useful information to be thinking about for Montana. Thanks so much, Robin and, and John. Ah. Thanks for putting this together. Um, and Robin, I got your email. I responded. I'll, uh, I'll see you guys later. Thanks. Okay. All, All right. right. Take care. Great. Give our best to your father and the rest yes, of your sir. family. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, guess that's it. All right. Well, John, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I don't think we're going to meet this evening. Correct. I guess. Um, <laughs>